what I found from running for president is, is something that I want to share with you. And that is that there is an underlying unity in this country. There, there really is a, um, a, a desire for some deeper structural changes in the, way, in, in the way we're doing things in this country. Well, first of all, let me welcome you to Washington. And uh, it's been my experience in, over the last few years in meeting with students from Mount Madonna that you represent a very special uh, institution and a very special pursuit of knowledge where young people get the chance to go really deep on questions that relate to governance, to um, uh, relations between people and country. And as a result of that, you get a chance to achieve some insights that will prepare uh, each and every one of you for uh, the opportunity to make a contribution to the world at large, to become more effective citizens, not only of the United States, but effective citizens of the world. And so I'm grateful to have a chance to be with you here. And I think that it's more important for me to hear from you and to hear your questions so that we can get into a discussion here than it is for me to be in in a monologue, so let's talk. All right. Um, so Ray Suarez has a quote that says, we're not driving you towards some conclusion about the news, about what to believe about the future of this country. We're trying to arm you for the work of being a good citizen. And of course, he has his uh, answer to what that work is, but I'm wondering what, what is Who that work? Who said that again? Ray Suarez? OK, right. <coughs> right. And I'm just interested, uh, what, what's your take on that quote? What, what well, is first of all, I wouldn't use the word arm, because that's a military metaphor. And I think one of the things we need to look at is our language. Because the military metaphor is so imbued into our language and so many things that we do, uh, that uh, we unconsciously end up being in a paradigm of continual conflict. So now let's move beyond that. <laughs> yeah. I'm interested in... What is, in your opinion, the work of being a good citizen? Emerson said, above all, to thine own self be true. Every heart vibrates to that iron string. He wrote that in his essay called Self-Reliance. Uh, the first thing is to tell the truth to yourself. Being a good citizen doesn't mean going along with whatever the status quo is so that you appear to be a good American while our country is, let's say, at war against innocent people. Uh, but a good citizen tells the truth as he or she knows it. And when you become familiar with the truth, when you pursue truth through your thoughts, when you speak truth, when you act in concordance with the truth, you then exemplify truth. A good citizen exemplifies truth. Um, and I think it starts with that. Uh, we live in a time where citizenship, good citizenship, and patriotism is often defined as going along with leaders. It's not good citizenship, and it's not patriotic or matriotic. It is actually an abdication when one gives up his or her innermost convictions and belief to a party to uh, the idea of nation. Uh, but when we merge as uh, bearers of truth, then there's real power there. Then there's an outcome that has something to do with uh, uh, seeking to achieve a higher condition for everyone. But right now, we're, we're wrapped in so many different illusions in our society that come from uh, image as opposed to substance, that come from uh, uh, distortion of fact, and propaganda as compared to truth. And so I caution everyone, first, stand for the truth. Then you should be, um, at some point, recognized as being a good citizen. <laughs> or maybe you're not recognized, but it doesn't matter. Thank you. Anyone? In our interview today with Ray Suarez, he also said that, um, there's this self-fulfilling notion of um, being fulfilled in powerlessness in our culture today. And I want to ask you, um, what sort of wake-up call can
can, can snap America out of that powerlessness? Well, first of all, there has to be power for all or for none. Each person has power. Uh, in a poem about the month of June, a poet uh, wrote uh, uh, about uh, every clod or piece of earth feeling a stir of might, an instinct within it that reaches and towers. Every one of us has an instinct within us that reaches and towers, that, uh, uh, that seeks a higher condition. Uh, we, we cannot um, capitulate to notions of powerlessness because that then becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. The, um, the way to achieve power is through integrity, is, is to, uh, uh, to stand for the truth and stand for what you believe in, and not assert it because some, f some friend or higher uh, up may uh, give you some position or something. It's not about that. Uh, so the, um, uh, we, we come too often in our society to identify power with, uh, with wealth, with office, with military might. Uh, those are all illusions of power. They're not real power. Power is more of an innermost condition. It's the ability to be able to stand apart from the crowd, the ability to be able to uh, express the truth when others refuse to uh, embrace it, the ability to be able to, uh, uh, in the words of the poet Shelley, to defy power which seems omnipotent. And so uh, we really have to, when people talk about power, we have to seek definitions. Uh, some would say America is the most powerful country in the world, but yet we're squandering our position by uh, identifying power with military might. Uh, so, some will say that China's the most powerful country in the world based on its size and, and its economic position. Uh, others would say it's squandering it based on uh, the tight control it has over its people. So it starts with what's innermost, because what's innermost becomes outermost. And what's innermost prepares us for our, uh, to be uh, effective, to be uh, to be free, really. It really is about, in, in the end, it's about human freedom. And it's about our ability to be able to, uh, uh, t to understand freedom is not given to us by a government, but as being an inherent right of, uh, of self-expression. Mm -hmm. Well, I can tell that you're really, you really believe what you're saying as far as truth and speaking the truth, and I read that for your run in the presidential, presidential campaign, that you based it off of voicing important ideas to the American people. And I want to know if this got your, what, if you were able to get your ideas across with this approach. Well, it's not, it's not difficult to get one's ideas across uh, uh, in speaking directly to people. I ran for president because I see something that's different. I see the world as being interconnected and interdependent. I see the world as, um, as being one. When you, when, you, when you comprehend the world in that way, war um, does not have a place in such a world any more than uh, a gun would have a place in a family where there's a disagreement. Because that gun could destroy the, f the family by destroying an individual or individuals within that family. Armaments are not a solution. They're postponing solutions and actually exacerbating conditions. So we, we need to take a new direction in resolving <coughs> differences, but we need to start with an, uh, the philosophical uh, understanding of, of human unity. There's an imperative here. Human unity is an imperative. We, we must come to an understanding that we're all one. If we fail to understand that, we shall destroy each other. We, we have to understand the, that, that this um, fragile web of interconnections bind us each to another. And, and that's, you know, so I ran for president to remind people of that. I ran to win, but look, you know, when you're challenging uh, a certain way of thinking, 
it takes people a while to be able to get to that point. Now, you know, my background is from a working class family in Cleveland, Ohio. My father was a truck driver. I was the oldest of seven. My parents never owned a home. We lived in 21 different places by the time I was 17, including a couple cars. So I come from a, a, an understanding of, of what, are, what, a cent, you know, what the practical aspirations are of people for jobs, for decent wages, for housing, for health care, for an education. Very simple things. Those are really needs of people all over the world. When governments spend huge amounts of money in arms buildups, that has nothing to do with the needs of their people. It's generally an excuse to ignore the needs of the people and to enhance the wealth of a few. So I come from a kind of, from a, from a, um, an economic background that, um, uh, that very few people get the opportunity to be in a position to challenge the status quo. But, but since I do come from that, I, I have a certain level of economic analysis that sees that, uh, that, the abs that one of the reasons why we don't have peace is there is a maldistribution of wealth. As a matter of fact, our entire country has become an engine for the distribution of wealth upwards. It's a real problem. You cannot have peace when you have so many poor people and just a few wealthy people. That's, it's not gonna, you're not going to have peace. And when your economy is built to, um, uh, for war, when it's built for ruining the environment, how are you going to have peace? How are you going to have peace between nations? So if you come from an understanding that we're all in this together, then you move towards a, an understanding that we can actually improve the human condition. And it's not hopeless. But, but you cannot speak out unless you're free to do so. And the only way you can be free to do so is to, uh, is to have not just a political independence, but an independence of thought. To be able to look at things and, and, and look at them, not because of what you read, you know, read heard on TV, you know, saw on TV, heard on the radio, read on the internet, but because what, you, what res resonates with some innermost understanding that you have about what's true. So back to Emerson, trust thyself. You have to have trust in yourself. Yeah. Uh, America seems to be intent on exporting its idea of a democracy around the world. Uh, what do you think we need to do to improve our own practices of democracy? Right, right, good point. Uh, first of all, you can't export democracy. That's, that, that's antithetical. It's a contradiction in terms. You can't force democracy in another country. Uh, that's just a cover. And we have no right. We have no right to tell another nation who their leader should be. We have no right to assassinate the leaders of other countries or to plan their assassination. We have no right to invade other countries, to dominate them militarily, to grab their resources. There's a whole system of international law set up to protect nations from, uh, from being victimized by more powerful nations. And yet the United States has violated international law in our attack on Iraq. Let's talk about a democracy. A democracy means that your citizens are healthy. It means that your citizens are well educated. We've got a long way to go. <coughs> then once we are able to do that, then we can talk uh, about what we might be able to do to share our understandings with other nations. But um, we've got a long way to go. And I say this with great love for my country. But uh, I think the measure of one's love for one's country is uh, one's willingness to tell the truth about what's going on. Thank you. you love somebody in a relationship. Think about this. How many relationships are built on illusion? We don't want to say anything. You see something, yeah, you better not say anything because you love them. Relationships like that do not last. They're painful. But when you are in a relationship and you see something that needs to be called to the attention of another person, you can do it in a loving way that at the same time gives someone a chance to grow. We have a lot of growing opportunities in this country. So when you're in the house and you're trying to deal with your peers, it, it's got to be a problem when they don't really see eye to eye with you and you're, you, you, know, you have different opinions about important issues. How do you get them to level down with you and how do you, how do you reach consensus in your job? Well, at my height, it's hard to see eye to eye with a lot of people. <laughs> so I don't fault them for that. <laughs> Mm 
you start with respect for the other person. It's not whether we agree. Concurrence doesn't necessarily lead to peace. Uh, you can force concurrence. Parties enforce concurrence that's often false. You need to listen to what the other person has to say. Keep your heart open. Share your knowingness. But, uh, uh, and, and then people will respect that. But always maintain respect for the other person. Even if you may have a serious disagreement with them. And talk to them. You know, sometimes you can all, you know, we always learn by talking to others. By hearing what people have to say about why they think the way they think. And then when you have your respective positions, you know, the truth can be like a compass. There can be 360 degrees. It's not absolute. When you share your understandings and another person shares his, you develop a relationship that may be the basis for forging new conditions. It's really about human relations. It's not about positionality. It's not about being smarter than someone else. It's about being compassionate and keeping one's heart open. It seems to me that interconnectedness is a core spiritual and ecological um, teaching. When did you come to this understanding of interconnectedness? As a child walking through a park, walking through the forest, really feeling at one with nature. This is so important for children to have that opportunity because when you uh, connect with nature and you understand that we're part of nature, we're not apart from it, we're not to dominate nature, we're, we're, we're part of this fragile ecology of which is the world. And so I'd say that uh, as, as a child, um, seeing the connection with, the, feeling a connection with the natural world. I read that you said in an interview that peace means being in harmony with nature. How can we achieve that harmony while there's so much focus being put on the economy and everything with the uh, global economy? Well, we have to have economy for peace. We have to have technology for peace. We have to understand that we can, uh, if we come in harmony with nature, we can meet our energy needs, solar and wind, for example. Uh, the, I mean, just for starters. We have to, um, uh, to see that when we disconnect from nature, there's not just pain, but there's also, inevitably, environmental destruction. Uh, Alfred North Whitehead, the philosopher, once wrote that the greatest technological advances of mankind are processes that all but destroy the societies in which they occur. Uh, there's a book that was written 30 years ago by a person by the name of Morris Berman. If you can find it, it's worth reading. It's called The Reenchantment of the World. And it talks about how before the Industrial Revolution, uh, there was a uh, humanity had a greater, greater connection to nature that once the Industrial Revolution started, we began to let our machines take uh, control of who we are. And so we became entrained with our machines. And um, we, we then lost uh, some of our humanity. And so what, what have we seen happen in the Industrial Revolution? We've seen this massive extraction of the resource of the Earth, of, of, of wood, of, of water, of minerals, just all taken up, okay? Now some will say, well, that's a corollary of economic progress. But there has to be other ways in which we have economic progress. It cannot just be from drilling the earth, from mining the earth, from creating pollution by burning the materials that come from the earth. We see what's happened. The, the result of that is the earth actually becomes endangered. Global climate change is really the earth turning, turning on all the technologies that have been uh, the result of extraction <coughs> of the resource of the earth. So we, we need to come into harmony with the earth in our agricultural processes, 
harmony with nature in our in our um, in our in our diets. Um, we need to come into harmony with the globe and our energy consumption. Harmony with each other. You create a resonant field that creates harmony with all. With all, when you when you start from the principle of harmony with nature, which is peace. Um, <coughs> anyone else? Yes. Yeah. Um, you talked about creating a culture of peace in the world, and I'm wondering, do you think that is it's possible or feasible given the population and just the like you talked about how we eat and all that, and I'm wondering, is that, do you think we can achieve that given... Well, well let's talk about peace for a second. Um, it, you know, I've said this before, but it's, it's easy to talk about peace in the world. Try bringing it and bringing principles of peace into your own life. Think about that. Think about it in terms of your relationships. Having relationships which are peaceful involves respect, reciprocity, compassion, real love. You build that. Um, that creates peace. Peace, peace is a radiating princi principle of, uh, of, of goodness. It starts from one's own heart. You cannot advocate peace in relationships unless you find a way to bring it into your own heart. You cannot advocate peace in the world unless you find a way to bring that peace to your own heart. Peace is, is kind of a, um, uh, a sense of tranquility, a sense of knowingness that everything's going to be all right, an understanding that you're not going to let anybody um, uh, come into your life that will cause you to sacrifice the peace that, that is essential to who you are. So, um, but we're all moving in an environment where we're challenged every day. So, so we first, when we talk about peace, it's, it's how do we ourselves, every day in all of our interactions, practice principles of peace? It goes with our thinking, because there's a sense in which we have to discipline ourselves, not to put ourselves in a position where we're thinking about aggression or hurting anyone. I don't <coughs> care who you are, you're, you, you always have to deal with this. Um, and, and again, relationships are really important. We, we learn a lot from relationships because they teach us a lot about ourselves, who we are, what we need to do um, in order to become more peaceful. Um, think of how many relationships are based on something that's not peaceful. People yelling at each other, people beating each other up, people beating each other up emotionally. <coughs> you know, I think young people in particular, you know, when you, if you start to explore that territory, you'll learn more about peace than you could learn going into international forums and listening to leaders speak. That's nothing. <coughs> it's, what are you doing? What's the question about yourself? Because that's where it starts. It's not abstract. It's very concrete <coughs> and personal. So. You know, there are many paths to that. Some are philosophical, religious, uh, health, all kinds of ways in which people pursue a path to peace. But it starts, it starts with an understanding uh, and a willingness to pursue something in one's life. It takes a long time, I'll tell you. I mean, I'm not where I want to be. But you, you, we have to, and we have to have compassion towards ourselves. We, we can't, you know, we don't <coughs> condemn ourselves. If you're not tough on yourself, you're not going to be too tough on somebody else. So yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, but you have to give yourself a chance to, to take steps every day. So I mentioned that to back to your question about peace. We create the conditions for peace for ourselves. We create when we come to that understanding. You're right at the age right now where you can you can, get the connections. You have some a little bit more control over the, over what happens. A little bit more of a conscious ability to decide how you're going to express yourself. Young children don't have that too much. I have a book out right now called The Courage to Survive, where I talk about my experience growing up in the inner city, where we moved, lived at all these 21 different places, and it, I kind of chronicle the movement. 
a lot of combat inside the home. When I left home at age 17 to be out on my own, it took me two years to get used to the quiet of living alone. And, and I say that because, you know, I mean, we, we had fights going on all the time between my parents, uh, between siblings. It, it was like combat going on all the time. And so, you know, a lot of, there, there's a lot of reasons why that kind of stuff happens. But when we get to a point in our own lives where we get a chance to make our own decisions, how we want to live, we, we can decide that. But we, we always got to be careful, you know, careful what you say. Because that can, w words can start wars. Words, words uh, a harsh word spoken can be very difficult to take back. It affects people emotionally. They can live with it forever. You know what I'm talking about. You, you say something and somebody will throw it back in your face years later. You know, so that's why you have to think about it. You create peace. It's about ourselves. It's not just about, you know, it's not about George Bush and these other world leaders. No. What do we do? What do we stand for in our everyday life? When we do that, then we create peace. Then everybody we touch can understand a more peaceful expression. And, and I, I think everyone yearns for that. They just don't know how to do it. So we, so we become, when we, when we teach ourselves, we can teach others too. And it is possible to do that. It is possible to do that. Do you think um, growing up in a kind of hostile environment with a lot of uh, arguments going on, um, do you think that affected your outlook today and your ideals of a peaceful world? Well, you know what, it, um, I mean, it, if you get a chance to read the book, it, it, it'd be a, it's a different kind of life that I've lived. But I will tell you that um, it, it, it gave me a lot of compassion for what people go through. Um, but you can see how, how unless you consciously seek to choose peace over violence, you can see how, pe how violence can be transmitted one generation to the next. Abusers, you know, the abuse becomes the abuser. It happens. But you can break the cycle. You don't have to repeat it. It's not inherited. You can break the cycle. So, did, you know, um, it, it gave me a broader understanding of what people go through and the kind of things that can drive people to, um, to, to alcoholism, to uh, depression, to insanity, really. So, you know, there's... Um, uh, we really have such power to create more positive conditions in which we live. We cannot look at the world as though we're victims, you know, that we're always acted upon. Well, so-and-so did this to me. No, we, you, have to, you have to look at what's your role in, in that and stepping back and how then you can try to redefine a situation. It's re that's, really, that's real power. How can you rework a situation that you're in? And, and, uh, and, and can create, a, create a new condition. We have the chance to do that every day. I, I really appreciate this opportunity to spend some time with you. Some of you already know what, where you see yourself. And you, know, you may have a dream that's, that other people will say, nah, not going to happen. Forget them. <laughs> it's, how do you get to where, where you want to be in life? You take one step at a time each day in that direction, <coughs> and you uh, and, and you do everything that you can um, every day to point yourself uh, to, to prepare yourself um, intellectually, uh, spiritually, emotionally as you move along, because you, you'd be surprised. It's like magic. You know, we all we all uh, get what we want. Just have to be careful what you ask for. <laughs> you always achieve what you want. I think it was Unamuno once said that. He said, since we uh, ultimately achieve the uh, things that we strive for, we should only strive for high things. So strive for high things. Thanks. Bye. Thank you very much. So stay in touch. And if there's any way that I can be of assistance to any of you at any time, I'm more than happy to. <coughs> you just have to say the magic words, Mount Madonna. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Thank Thank you so, so much. much.